Hi, everyone. Good afternoon from New York City to all our viewers in North America, Europe, Romania, and anywhere in the world. Welcome to a um, new edition of the Leon Ferraro Conferences Online, one of our permanent programs dealing with topics relevant, even urgent, on both sides of the Atlantic. Today is the International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day, one of the most important dates in the world's memorial calendar. And we thought uh, it would be uh, important, uh, it would be timely to talk about uh, topics like uh, extremism, polarization, radicalization, weaponization of national identities. And to talk about these topics uh, in, the context, in the context of um, a Romanian and European uh, past, present, and future. And we believe uh, we have um, the perfect interlocutor to tackle these um, topics historian Oliver Sienz Schmidt, one of the leading experts in uh, Southeastern European um, history, professor of history at the University of Vienna, president of the um, Division of Humanities and uh, Social Sciences at the Austrian Academy of Sciences and author of uh, several important books uh, on the history of the region, among which uh, two monstrously researched and uh, utterly courageous um, monographs, one dedicated to Cornelius Zelia Codreanu, the leader of um, uh, Romanian fascist movement uh, in the interwar period, uh, the other one to uh, Skanderbeg, uh, the um, Albanian medieval uh, hero, and also um, the author of a book uh, of a sort of review of 100 years of um, Romanian uh, uh, history, um, a book, uh, I would say, one of the, um, uh, the most interesting historical accounts on Romania I have um, read in years. Professor Schmidt, uh, welcome to the program. Yeah, good evening from Vienna. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's evening in uh, Vienna, it's afternoon in, um, in, um, in New York. Uh, you are a specialist in Southeastern European um, history with a special focus on, uh, on Romania. I would dare to say that there are few uh, in the Western world who know Romania better than you do, who, has, who have understood Romania better than you have um, understood it. Uh, where does this, this interest in Romania, in Romanian history come from? Actually, it started very early and it's mainly also um, thanks to my family, although there are no family links uh, with direct family links with Romania. But I, I remember when I, was, when I was a child, we visited the town of Baden-Baden in Germany. And there is a very famous uh, chapel, um, which was uh, donated, uh, founded by the Romanian prince Stursa from the famous Stursa family. And this was my very first contact with Romanian architecture. And um, at that time, it seemed very exotic, very mysterious also to me. And then the second um, stage, I would say, and this was a much more serious one, was then in uh, the experience of 89, the Romanian revolution, which for me was a TV revolution. I mean, um, at uh, the high school I attended in Switzerland, this was a very important topic. And also my high school teachers, they changed the program now. And then we were watching what, what was happening in Bucharest. And, and my teachers, they, um, they, they simply, they told us, and look, these people are fighting for freedom. Probably they, they know much better what freedom actually is than you uh, who have been born in privileged uh, free uh, Switzerland. So these were, so let's say two incentives and certainly my, my, my father played a very important role because in the 80s he told me quite a lot uh, about Romania. 
and um, my my home village actually in in, uh, in Switzerland was a partner uh, was the partner town of Blage in Transylvania, and so that's why I came across Blage, um, so a town that played an enormous role mainly in 19th century intellectual history in Transylvania, and last but not least, so I'm a Reformed Christian, and uh, our sister church was the Calvinist Church, the Hungarian Calvinist Church in in Transylvania. So they were even before I learned the first word of Romanian many, many links. And then I came to Vienna um, to study and I met quite a lot of Romanian colleagues here at the university. And then I started learning uh, to learn Romanian actually in the kitchen of the, of the students' residence. <laughs> um, a language that you speak so, uh, so well. It's, uh, uh, it's amazing how, uh, how well you, you speak it. And you know, I can only regret that we couldn't have this um, conversation in, uh, in Romanian. So we can prove, uh, we can prove that. In your capacity as a professor of Southeastern European studies and also uh, a professor of Romanian history, um, as part of this, uh, the history of this region, you have the chance to uh, speak about Romanian history to foreign audiences. Um, what do you find most difficult to explain? What are the things that uh, remain obscure or very hard to understand for uh, foreigners when it comes to um, Romanian history? I would say that, that my audiences are very mixed. I mean, this has to do both with uh, tourism to Romania and also with the uh, immigration of Romanians to Central and Western Europe. I would, uh, I would dare to say that perhaps um, uh, 30 years ago, um, the, the, the level of ignorance was much higher um, than it is than it is today. Today, the audiences are very mixed. I have among, for instance, uh, average uh, students audience here in Vienna, um, people who have visited Romania, and these people usually have a very positive image. I would say that rather people who have not visited Romania and just read about the country in the newspaper, I mean, it's very rarely covered um, by, by newspapers and usually rather than in negative context, but those people who have been to Romania come back usually with a very, very positive image. What is of course difficult to, um, to explain is, but I think that's also quite normal in a kind of, let's say in an approach of national history, that the, the country is far more complex than um, a simple uh, national narrative could convey as a, as a, as a first idea. I think that the what was this really the fascination of Romania? It's the enormous wealth of um, different cultural influences. Also, the Romanian language, not the modern one, but let's say the Romanian language that was spoken still until, let's say, the, the interwar period, which was much richer also in vocabulary, really mirrors that. I mean, Romania is at the crossroads of different cultural areas, it's Central Europe, um, Balkans, it's East Central Europe, Eastern Europe, but even the Pontic area. And I mean, if you visit, for instance, the Eastern part of Romania, you will even find influences from Georgia and church architecture. And I would say um, the best way to understand the, the complexity of Romanian culture is to have a look at the church uh, and the churches, the monasteries and their architectures. And then you can really see of how um, different kind of, um, of cultural influences then came together and then a, a completely new and proper kind and a unique kind then of culture, uh, culture emerged that was not, let's say, national in the way um, it was usually portrayed in, uh, in school books but very mixed. So you have Greek princes um, as, uh, let's say, lords of the Romanian uh, principalities. You have um, uh, intellectuals in, in 18th century Transylvania who studied um, in Rome and, and other towns. So it's especially this complexity. So once you, you start to, um, to scratch a bit on the surface, you see that what looks as very, uh, let's say, uh, homogenized or homogeneous um, society. This was mainly the goal of the communist period is far more complex. And it's exactly this complexity, which is so beautiful. And are there some uh, tenacious uh, stereotypes that you are bothered by when talking to foreigners about Romania? Do you encounter that as well? 
I would say rather rarely. I mean, certainly, I mean, the, the, the average knowledge on Romania, but Romania, there is no exception. I would say um, if you if you talk to countries as Poland or to the Baltic states or so to an average um, Central European or Western European, so the level is rather low. Um, I mean, what people know in terms of figures, of course, the last um, communist dictator Ceausescu, this is certainly, I, this is for sure that most people still of a certain age, they would still um, remember him. But then I would say that the, the, uh, the image has really changed. I mean, people who are politically interested, they would rather remember so the Romania of the last years of the huge demonstration for democracy and, 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 and civic rights, um, because this was something very unusual. No one would have except, uh, expected, let's say 20 years ago that in comparison to Hungary or Poland or the Czech Republic, uh, the, the Romanians would turn out those who really uh, go into the streets and, and demonstrate for, for civic rights. And I think this has changed also a bit the, the, the image of Romania. That's why it's a very mixed uh, thing. In, I, I, um, I mentioned um, one of your uh, most recent books. I mean, you have several that I have uh, mentioned, um, obviously, uh, but in one, one particular book that I that I enjoyed very much and I learned uh, a lot from it was a sort of review of um, Romania since the um, uh, the unification of uh, all uh, Romanian provinces in 1918 uh, and the creation of uh, what came to be known as a Greater uh, Romania and looking to uh, looking at this. Um, uh, this 100 years of um, modern uh, modern Romania, in many respects, our country is very much what the country created in um, 1918. So looking back at the century of uh, modern uh, Romania, you concluded that uh, Romanians uh, had never have, it, have never had it bef uh, as good um, as, um, uh, as uh, today. Uh, that uh, that now uh, Romanians have the best life that they can um, uh, can have uh, uh, ever uh, enjoyed in these 100 years, and uh, and this is a um, a very um, a very um, um, a clear uh, conclusion, a very um, uh, well underlined conclusion. Um, why is that? How do you explain uh, this? Could you elaborate a little bit about uh, about this um, uh, conclusion? Mm. I know it um, it sounds a bit bizarre, mainly to yeah. Romanian eyes, because uh, I mean, if we have a look at it, the current situation, millions and millions of Romanians uh, have emigrated. Uh, most of them uh, did not emigrate voluntarily, but uh, out of let's say um, eco uh, economic reasons. I mean, poverty. Uh, and, uh, and other reasons. And certainly this is a very painful experience. And um, if you have, for instance, a look at uh, YouTube and there are quite a lot of singers uh, who made their career with very nostalgic uh, songs, for instance, Laura Olteanu with more than 30 million clicks on YouTube and uh, singing on Romania and using really also images uh, and, and sounds that um, obviously go to the heart of people. And then, and to tell these people um, that it's, it's the best time Romanians ever had in modern history is provocative. And I must say that um, after the publication of this booklet, I got quite a lot of mixed um, reactions. And that's why I think it's a very pertinent question. So why? Because you are, I, you are I, never far from you are never far from controversy, Professor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but but in, in this time it was I think a rather um, positive provocation in the sense that, that what I wanted to show is that um, despite the difficulties, this is still the best time the Romanians had in the last one hundred years because I mean after the downfall of communism in eighty nine, many people longed for the interwar period, and they idealized and glorified the interwar period. So 1918, as you mentioned, the um, Romanian national state, the kingdom of greater Romania was unified. And this was perceived as a kind of golden age. But if you have a closer look, I mean, this state was rather a facade democracy. Um, it was it very 
quickly um, turned into a kind of hidden um, dictatorship of the king. Uh, corruption was a, was a main issue. And then also the rise of extremism. Um, poverty was widespread. I mean, you had a uh, mortality rate of uh, newborn child. Uh, Romania was number one in Europe, things like that. You had widespread also diseases like the Pelagra and so on, because most people live from Mama Liga, so from Romanian style of polenta, which um, in many um, poor areas was of very bad quality. So there was, Bucharest was the Paris of the East. And there was there was glitter, and for the for the upper classes, of course, this was a wonderful life. But for let's say the majority of the population, and Romania was a very rural uh, um, country with enormous social differences. This certainly was not the case. And then came the long period of these dictatorships that started in thirty eight with the royal dictatorship. Then you had the military dictatorship that was responsible for the Shoah. I mean, you mentioned the Holocaust Remembrance Day. And then one of the most terrible communist regimes until 89, so without any kind of democracy and participation. And it started in the, in the 40s with a, a genocidal regime. And then uh, the regime then cracked down on, the, uh, on its own, on the titular nations, also on ethnic Romanians. So it, it was a kind of very long nightmare, or if you want a kind of a hiatus also in the as such, it was perceived by many Romanian intellectuals. That's why in the 90s, people were looking backwards and they believed that if they, they can discover, they can dig out somewhere in the past a better Romania. And what I wanted simply to say is that this interwar period of greater Romania is probably not, let's say, this golden age. It's, I mean, it has very positive sides for certain parts of the society, but taken as a whole um, in terms of democracy, uh, rule of law, and especially, and I think that's the crucial argument, the possibility of many people to decide on their own fate. Yeah. And that's what, and, and, and one of the most important, certainly social developments is that for the first time in Romanian history, there is something like a Romanian, ethnic Romanian middle class, urban, mid, well-educated middle class, because in the interwar period, um, these middle classes existed, but they were ethnically mostly not Romanian. So they were German, Jewish, uh, Hungarian, sometimes also Russian in the eastern part of Romania. But so there is now a real, um, let's say, uh, substantial change, social change in Romania. And these people, although this, uh, the situation still, of course, is a shaky one, but these people are also the backbone of those developments that I mentioned before. So that uh, in Romania, there is now, they are people who are trying also to invest in institutions. And they are trying to invest in democracy because they want, it, they want to stay in the country. I mean, one should not idealize the situation, but still compared to the inter in the interwar period, you had demonstrations, but these people were right-wing ext extremists. They were fascists. Then in the communist period, of course, there were millions of people in the streets because they were forced to do by, by the regime. I mean, it was not, they were not um, uh, voluntarily um, out there. But now for the first time, you have mass demonstrations in Romanian history for um, democracy and for the values, let's say, of the Western world. And this is really something very new. And that's why I believe, despite all the economic problems and despite many institutional aspects are not, not yet settled, but still, um, this is uncomparable to what Romanians lived um, before. I, I, I tend to, uh, to agree with you, especially when you take into account so many indicators, um, political, economic, and social uh, indicators that are quite, uh, quite objective, even though sometimes we don't feel that's the, mm -hmm. that's the case. And also probably the enthusiasm for the interwar period was also due in the 90s, I, I lived through that, uh, that period, to the rediscovery of an intellectual continent that was quite suppressed during the communist times. Great figures of the great intellectual figures, great books, uh, great more intellectual and cultural models um, that were, um, uh, were out of reach for, uh, for most of us were rediscovered and probably the, the enthusiasm was to a certain uh, extent, um, it was genuine, but uh, to a certain extent was understandable. 
Yeah, it's absolutely understandable because, I mean, this, this, it was a kind of Orwellian system. I remember when I first came uh, to Romania, I also felt this, this sensation that, that the people rediscovered things. And that's why the, the admiration of for, um, for people who lived in this period and played a certain role. And there was one figure, it was Cornelio Coposo. So one of the, um, the most closest collaborators of one of the emblematic figures of Romanian democracy and also democratic tendencies in the interwar period, Yuliu Maniu, and Coposu survived the communist regime and he was a kind, I perceived him, at least this was my perception when I talked to Romania friends and colleagues, as a kind of biological proof that a different Romania existed, that he was a kind of, of, of physical bridge between the post-communist Romania and the Romania that existed before, before communism. Because, uh, I mean, as you say, the communists um, try to destroy the memory. And that's why it was really kind of, um, let's say, uh, a society coming out of, a, of an Orwellian uh, system of destruction of the past, who tried, um, at that, which tried at that time to reconstruct this past. And of course, this was essential. It's absolutely understandable. And, and I would add, even though we will talk a lot about extremism and, uh, and the, the, the destruction of democracy, I would argue that looking back at the Romanian history, you can see a string of democratic tradition uh, in personalities, in parties, in institutions, imperfect, yes, uh, with corruption, yes, but still you had, and you mentioned uh, Yuliu Maniu, but there are other intellectuals in the interwar period that even though it was so difficult to, uh, to uh, keep the center alive when, you know, societies, as we all know so well, um, were so polarized, were so radicalized. Um, it, there still were intellectuals, artists, uh, uh, politicians that continue to believe in democracy, in parliamentarian uh, uh, democracy, and in a, a democratic future of, uh, of Romania. On the other yeah. side, and this, this is your speciality, and we must talk about these things, there were, uh, there were aspects in that history that was um, problematic, complex. Um, uh, there were aspects that were definitely tragic as our contribution to the Holocaust. And, uh, and Romania, the Romanian state, the democratic contemporary state has acknowledged the, our role in the Shoah. And uh, today we celebrate the International um, Holocaust Remembrance Day. And I think we ought to look back at our, um, at our role in this, um, uh, this horrible um, uh, tragedy. What was, um, what was Romanians, uh, Romania's involvement in the Holocaust? Yeah. So Romania, um, as a, also let's say the small Romania before 1914, had a rather long history of um, anti-Semitism. This was mainly due to um, uh, the immigration of uh, many Jews from the Russian Empire to Eastern Romania to the Principality of Moldova in the 19th century, which um, actually changed all the social structures, mainly in towns, for in, in towns, in urban societies as Yash, for instance, so that this was the capital of the Principality of Moldova in the, um, uh, in the, let's say in the second half of the 19th century, almost half, sometimes even more than the half of the population uh, was of um, Jewish origin. And that's why many Romanian intellectuals um, perceived the Jews as a kind um, of um, superposed social um, group that uh, blocked the emancipation of uh, Romanian peasant masses. At least this was the way it was, uh, it was presented. So, so it was not a racial, but rather a social, sometimes also religious anti-Semitism. And one of the leaders um, of Romanian anti-Semitism was a university professor at Yash, uh, Alexandru Constantin Cusa, who, when he was a very old man in the 30s, uh, prided himself to be to have been a kind of insp inspiration uh, for for Hitler. So he claimed also a leading role of European anti-Semitism. So this is to say that um, anti-Semitism was not something important uh, imported, but uh, it was um, so homegrown um, because, uh, let's say, of um, reasons that were specific also to Romanian 
political and social discourse. And so in the Second, in the second World War, um, Romania was uh, an ally of, um, of Germany. And um, let's say the Romanian uh, role in, in the Shoah um, and let's say focusing on this role should not downplay the responsibility of Germany. But it's perhaps also um, interesting for, for, for the audience to know how the, um, the Shoah then was um, uh, also treated as a political um, problem by the communist regime. So in the 1970s, um, the communist dictator Ceausescu started a kind of um, process of cultural political rehabilitation of Ion Antonescu, who was head of state and, and marshal and the main political responsible for the Shoah. And um, this continued also after um, the end of communism in Romania, because many circles also related to the communist secret service Securitate were deeply involved in this very nationalist um, campaign in order to um, uh, rehabilitate uh, Antonescu. So, that's why even uh, NATO um, accession of Romania in the, in the 90s was in the first round blocked and because of this veneration, even official veneration for uh, Ion Antonescu. What was his um, role? So um, Romania um, had to cede uh, a part um, of its territory in 1940 to the Soviet Union. This was also one of the major reasons, um, so the breakdown of Greater Romania that um, uh, the, the king had to resign, Antonescu and the military regime came to power and Antonescu's main goal was to regain lost territory uh, through a close alliance with Germany. And so he, he believed that he con could convince um, Hitler uh, to give back territory that Romania had to cede mainly to Hungary. So Romania started this, the war as an ally of Germany and in the first days of the war, also pogroms uh, started uh, on the territory in Romania. One of the most tragic one and terrible one was, uh, was in Yash. And there was for many, many years a uh, discussion about who is responsible um, for that. I mean, the Romanians um, blamed the Germans and there was um, among Romanian Holocaust deniers also the theory that there was no Holocaust on the Romanian territory. So there was no res uh, Romanian responsibility actually the slaughterhouse, if I may use this horrible word, was in Transnistria, so the, um, the area each uh, uh, to the east of the river Dniester or Nistru in Romanian, um, uh, area that stretched uh, down to Odessa on the Black Sea coast that was occupied by the Romanian armies and where the uh, Romanian authorities then deported also Jews from um, Eastern Romania. But things are very complex because the um, Jewish community in Romania was extremely heterogeneous. And it was in Southern Romania, most um, Jews were very well integrated and spoke Romanian. And um, they were hit by uh, discrimination, but they were spared the, the horrible fate that um, awaited um, Jewish uh, Yiddish speaking and Russian speaking Jews in Eastern Romania, while um, most Jews uh, in Transylvania spoke Hungarian, but one has to say that the Northern Transylvania was occupied by Hungary and the Hungary um, perpetrated uh, the, uh, the crimes um, of, uh, of Shoah. So it was a very complicated um, issue. Um, the uh, area where uh, most uh, people, most uh, Jewish people were murdered was not on the Romanian territory, but in occupied areas, but of course under the full responsibility of the Romanian state. And also research, recent research has also focused on the perpetrators. And it's clear that there are continuity lines between the uh, anti-Semitic uh, parties and, and activists of the interwar period and those people who then uh, committed uh, the crime. Perhaps it's also um, important to understand um, the reason and the strategy of Marshal Antonescu. Um, he wanted to create a homogenized, ethnically homogenized Romania. He deeply believed that national minorities and all kinds of, let's say, people who were not Orthodox Romanians would threaten the very existence of the state. And this was um, so the, the main driving force and behind that. So it was this was also a bit of difference from the um, from the ideology of uh, German national socialism. So it was not so much about um, race, 
but it's it was rather about on the uh, this old idea of emancipation of a peasant nation a peasant nation that had to conquer also the urban space that had also to develop the own uh, its own middle class but um, uh, as I said um, right at the beginning, so uh, Romania was an ally of Germany. Um, the uh, very important part of the respons responsibility, of course, is a German one, but it is, it's important to stress that Romania was not completely dependent on Germany. It had its own rationale, its own actors, and its own agency uh, in the Shoah. Yes, and I think it's important to speak about this uh, responsibility. And we have um, indeed um, um, many books are published. Uh, books are published every every year about about this um, episode in Romanian history that was definitely suppressed and uh, and uh, was even forbidden to talk about. Uh, and um, I think a balanced view. Uh, of, um, of this time um, has um, uh, emerged and, um, and we, we've had um, the pleasure to co cooperate, to have cooperated with some of these historians who are um, illuminating this um, darker, darker, probably the darkest, the darkest um, uh, part of our um, uh, modern history, I would, uh, I would argue. But um, uh, dark was um, the communist time in Romania as well. Uh, and uh, at the end of the 40s, um, as a result of the foreign, uh, foreign occupation, Soviet occupation, Romania became a, um, um, a communist uh, dictatorship. Of course, later um, uh, it wasn't um, occupied anymore and the communism was uh, pretty much an internal affair and, um, and the system perpetuated for another um, a couple of uh, decades um, in forms that uh, became very harsh, isolated, and uh, and um, and very very um, uh, humiliating for uh, for most of um, Romanians. Is it something exceptional in Romanian communism, seen in a comparative perspective? Uh, yeah, I, th I think. Look at um... the other communist uh, communist countries in uh, Eastern Europe, in Central uh, East Central Europe and elsewhere for that matter? I would say it's, 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 it, there are several aspects. I think let's start with the very beginning. Um, there is a kind of Romanian narrative that, um, uh, that blames mostly uh, members of national minorities that they were, would have been actually responsible for the communist takeover. So mainly Jews, Hungarians, communists and so on, uh, uh, and, and uh, Bulgarians and Russians and so on. And it's true that, um, uh, it's it's amazing to see how small the Communist Party in Romania was until the beginning of the year 44. And it's also true that the most members of this very small Communist Party were non-ethnic Romanians, but members of uh, national minorities. I mean, it's no wonder because, I mean, the, the Communist Party in the interwar period advocated uh, the, uh, let's say, more or less the territorial destruction of Romania. Uh, and uh, since the Soviet Union did not acknowledge the eastern border of Romania, so being a communist in the interwar period meant also that you were immediately also a traitor. So it did not attract ethnic Romanians. But, and this is interesting, how do we explain that within a couple of months, this party ex virtually exploded and that within a couple of months, hundreds of thousands of ethnic Romanians joined the Communist Party? How was it possible that a, a state like the Romanian state with the intact army, with the intact um, civil service, was so ready to accept communist rule. Why was there no um, res open resistance? I mean, there was some guerrilla group in the mountains, but uh, it's very interesting to see that and um, the traditional explanation that the national minorities are responsible for the takeover is, is certainly wrong. And it's um, probably it's one of the most painful questions of modern Romanian history, why um, Romanian society so quickly adapted uh, to communist rule. Of course, there was enormous pressure, 
Yeah. Um, of course, the, um, the geopolitical situation of the country was very difficult, but compared, for instance, to Hungary or Poland or Poland, there was no resistance. I mean, there are several reasons, and one very important one is Transylvania. I mentioned it briefly, so this part of Western Romania um, that had uh, been, uh, let's say, given back or ceded to Hungary under um, pressure of the Axis power, and uh, there was a kind of national consensus that Romania wanted to get it back. And this was only possible with uh, Soviet help, and that's why Romania sided in 1944, but also when the Hungarians rose in 1956, um, decided with the Soviets. Um, so this is, um, it's, not a a, it's not a specific feature of Romanian communism, but I think it's very important to stress that how communist rule was um, implemented, it was not, not so much against uh, the will of the Romanian people as a whole, but there were many opportunists. There were many people who went over and especially many former members of the fascist uh, legendary movement, because these people were anti-democrats. And the, the communists, they, they knew that they, they needed a very violent political base in order to crack down on the uh, democratic party. So the, there was a peasant party, and um, which was very strong, and the liberal party. So there was a very, let's say, a strong uh, democratic center. But this center was destroyed. Um, uh, by the communists, um, by by using former fascists, and I mean these people then also ended in in, in camps. Then what is also specific? I mean, many people, perhaps uh, also among the audience um, of the older generation, they will remember of how um, Romania looked like in the eighties, or how Romania, how the uh, let's say general reports on Romania were. So this was an isolated country. It was a country of not only of fear but of hunger and people simply um, in the in, in, in winter time, they had to live in apartments with about, let's say 12 degrees um, temperature, even less and in schools. So it was, um, it was really a nightmare. And they will also remember of how Romanian communism ended in 89 by bloodshed and violence. Mm -hmm. And this is also explained by the very fact that there was um, and this was not specific, but there were very few communist countries, especially in Europe, where there was no, let's say, internal opposition within the communist party or different groups or fractions. Um, the Romanian communist party had an extreme tight control uh, over its members and there were no outspoken opponents within the system. And that's why the reaction was so violent because pressure uh, was so high and also, let's say, uh, also the, the degree um, which people had to suffer in the communist regime. I mean, if you talk to them, you, you lived that. I, I met so many people who um, told me that. I will never forget that Romanian friends I met here in Vienna, uh, they, uh, they bought really quite a lot of food. And we never understood it, me and my colleagues. And they said, listen, this was in 94. Listen, five years ago, we were simply hungry. When we came back from, let's say, from training and the sports club, we were simply hungry. And they, these people lived in the capital in Bucharest. In small provincial towns, the situation was much worse. Um, and this is certainly, with the exception of Albania, um, uh, a feature that was specific to Romania. So this combination of uh, extreme austerity, uh, austerity um, policy, the, the, the goal was to pay back debts. This was, this was the main goal of the dictator, and it was even achieved. But the price was really enormous. So the population was starved, it was, it was desperate. The um, general overall situation, also the health situation was really, really horrible. And um, uh, the symbol, of course, were all these uh, this, um, poor um, children that uh, were given up by their families and then and for, uh, for whom the state could not take care. And perhaps it's also one of the point that some of the uh, audience, some members of the audience will be interested in is this so-called so pro-natalistic policy. I mean, the dictator Ceausescu dreamt of a, a huge Romanian nation of 30 million Romanians. And that's why uh, abortion uh, was prohibited. 
And uh, this, this combination of prohibition of abortion on the one hand side and the enormous pressure on, on women to have as many children as possible, but with any means of social assurance and social support mm -hmm. created also enormous misery. And um, this was once again not specific. Many communist dictators dreamt of this, uh, of, of these huge nations. But I think taken together, it explains also why uh, the breakdown of the communist regime in Romania was so violent in comparison to other countries. It was like the perfect storm, uh, I should say, uh, with all these factors coming uh, coming together. Well, I um, I came to age uh, during that time, but I um, I uh, I had my redemption in uh, in um, 1989. I'm from Kleine Wien, from the, the Timisoara, and uh, and uh, uh, you know we definitely had our uh, our time for that cold darkness and um, and hunger. And uh, after 1989, after this um, uh, very violent uh, revolution, uh, there came the slow uh, recovery that quite fast, I should say, in historical terms, brought Romania to European Union, to NATO, to uh, today's life that is radically, radically different from, uh, from what we experienced during communist times. Often I meet with people that who visited um, Romania in the 80s and they would tell me stories. I would say, my God, you know, that country no longer, uh, no longer uh, exists. But there were uh, consequences of these 45 uh, years of communism. What do you think are the most debilitating um, consequences of this, um, of this communist dictatorship um, and, uh, and these uh, decades of, uh, of tyranny? I would say it's the lack of trust. It's the lack of trust. Uh, I think that that's even more, uh, this has even more severe consequences than let's say the uh, remnants of the communist uh, economy and so on. Because um, um, Romania was a rather young national state when it was let's say created in 1918. It had very few years in which it had the chance to let's say create a democratic society, but the potential certainly was there, especially in the western parts of the country. So with the legacy of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, which was not only uh, let's say positive, but I mean, it was rule of law and especially in the Austrian part, the democratic system in the Hungarian part, it was a bit, it was a bit different, but, but still Romanians entered um, uh, from Transylvania, the Romanian national state in 1918 with, um, uh, let's say, a long culture of self-organization. They had a very clear idea of who they were. They had a very high degree also uh, of, of cultural life and of democratic resistance uh, against, let's say, the Hungarian uh, administrative system. Yeah. And of course, um, and these people had also a certain self-confidence. They had no nobility, but a very strong bourgeoisie. And there, this kind of middle class really existed. And also in some parts of Transylvania, also a class of very self-confident and also well-to-do um, peasants. But the, the communist system really completely destroyed um, also social ties. I mean, it was this system of surveillance, this system of um, suspicion, um, uh, this uh, a, a kind of erosion and also corrosion of, of social ties. And I think that's one of the most difficult things is uh, to reconstruct social trust that was lost. And especially then um, that when you see then also the political developments after 1990, the enormous difficulties to organize democratic um, parties and the this, this legacy also of the communist secret service that, that still lingers, that um, you can accuse people of having been spies or not. And also in many private conversations, it, it, seemed, it, it rather quickly um, pops up that um, they are, this, this person also is suspicion. So it's, it, it really, I think it's stronger. I, 
I would say only in Albania, uh, the system communist regime was able to destroy the society. There it was pro probably even more brutal. But um, on, the other, on the other side, I would say it's, it's very important to identify this point and then also to tackle it because um, one of the positive things is then of how parts of the Romanian society, especially this emerging middle class now invests in reconstructing trust. And that's why what we are now witnessing in Romania, it's really a kind of fight um, um, over the institutions. I mean, state institutions and trust into institutions, that's really crucial. And perhaps it's interesting for some of the um, people in the, in the audience also as a, as a personal experience. So since many years, I have been privileged to be an evaluator of the Romanian National Research Council. And I must say that um, this council and, and the way it works is it's more transparent than uh, its uh, Austrian counterpart, which I also know very well. And, uh, uh, and I was very impressed by Romanian colleagues who were working for this, uh, for this council. And they, they did more or less for, I mean, not for free, but I mean, the remuneration was very modest and they invested enormous amount of work. And especially when evaluating research projects and focusing only on quality on, on the base of transparent criteria, the project of many powerful people were rejected. And this was absolutely unusual that someone who has a power position in the system then sees his project re rejected. So you need a certain courage and then I ask, I mean, why do you do that? Is there a certain civic spirit behind that? And most people told me, no, simply, I mean, we had the privilege to have grants abroad in the United States, in Germany and so on. And we came back and we saw, and we uh, said um, to ourselves, we want to change the system. And there was no ideology behind it, just do it. And I was really impressed because this, um, I mean, this is a kind of game changer. Of course, the game is not won, has not been won because I mean, there are strong uh, forces that defend the old system. And I, um, I just um, wanted to show that and taking this, this personal e example to show that research is very important. I mean, we are talking about societies of knowledge and, and certainly also for Romania, this is a crucial uh, issue. It's about the education of people, not only the civic one, but if people want to stay in Romania, education is crucial. But education has to be open for all. And perhaps as another example, we have um, here also in Austria and Vienna, a growing number of really brilliant Romanian scholars. We have at my uh, institute, at my academy institute, uh, winner of um, a grant of the European Research Council. This is one of the most prestigious uh, grant you can get in Europe. So you have to be extremely competitive. And also um, this, this colleague was educated in, in, in Romania, but um, the problem is that Romania, the Romanian state institutions and universities and the academy, they still have to struggle to offer people who do not belong to certain networks, but who are simply brilliant, the opportunities they deserve. And this is certainly one of the major challenges. And coming back to your questions, uh, to your question, of course, it's not only the lack of trust, it's also the, um, the legacy of networks and also networks that reproduce themselves. And of course, who um, were capable of taking uh, control of very important parts of the political life and the economy of Romania after 89. And still, this is the major struggle yeah, of, let's say, civic values is also um, means that those who have a talent, those who work hard, that they get their chance and, and, and still Romania is not yet there, but compared, and that's once again going back to the beginning of our conversation, compared to the communist system or compared to the, uh, to the interwar period, someone um, who uh, is the son or the daughter of, let's say, a uh, worker uh, from Bukovina in Northern Romania now has the possibility to become an ERC winner in Europe. Uh, with open borders. And I think they are also good messages. One should not um, exaggerate, but still one should not downplay what happened in the, in the last 30 years. So it's a very mixed answer. And I wanted also to, to mix the legacies with developments that happened so that evolved in the last years. It's always good to have the historical uh, perspective and to, to discuss things in a comparative, uh, comparative manner. 
um, in a magisterial book, I want to call it magisterial because it's a, really a wonderful book and an, an example of a high scholarship. Uh, you wrote about a very mysterious and utterly deadly character, uh, Cornelius Elia Codreanu, the leader of um, the leader of uh, Romanian um, uh, uh, extreme right in the interwar uh, period. Of course, your book um, can be read in many ways, but one can uh, read it also as a study in, uh, in leadership, a perverse uh, form of leadership, but nonetheless a very powerful one. What was the source of, um, of fascination with this, uh, with this um, very strange, uh, strange character. Perhaps one, one can just start um, to, to answer your question by referring to the fact that uh, Cornelius Zelia Cotreanu is, is very popular also with uh, modern right-wing extremists. Also in the United States or in the Charlottesville incidents, for instance, there were American um, extreme right-wing activists that, uh, that even wore t-shirts with uh, Cotreanu and also in Italy. I mean, he's, he's a kind of, let's say, Che Guevara, um, because he's, he was a very handsome man uh, of the extreme right-wing movement. But coming back to your question, I mean, Codreanu uh, is really a very special figure because he was not an intellectual, not at all. I mean, he was not a great political thinker. He was a student's activist that uh, who reacted um, right after the uh, creation of Greater Romania, the University of Yash, to the influx of uh, students from Eastern Romania, mainly Russian speaking, mainly Jewish, and he did not feel at home. And what he addressed and what he expressed was the unease with which many ethnic Romanians reacted to the creation of Greater Romania. They were simply overwhelmed. I mean, what Romania got in 1918 was everything and even more than even the most extreme nationalist would ever have dreamt of. But there was no plan and um, people to integrate this very heterogeneous uh, new provinces and there was a great degree of anxiety. So there was the in, not only the influx of new students, but um, Romania was the neighbor of the Soviet Union. Uh, Romania had good reasons also to, um, to fear um, the revisionism of its neighbors. There was also the danger of um, social upheaval within. And main pillars of the Romanian state, so the Orthodox Church, uh, the army, uh, conservative forces would need it, desperately need it, a kind of new social base um, for, their, for their interests. And Romania introduced universal suffrage or universal voting system only after the First World War. So this was the next revolution. Many Romanian voters, male voters, were peasants. They were illiterate. I mean, how can, um, let's say, the traditional political party, how can they reach these illiterate, um, these illiterate new voters? And for that, they, they needed people as Codreanu, who presented him, himself, although he was a teacher's son, as a kind of uh, incarnation of the classical Romanian peasant. And he, even his origin was ethnic, ethnically very mixed. But he became a kind of hero and, let's say, cover boy of the Romanian students' movement of the 20s. And he, and, and he was presented at that. And there was enormous hype. It was a media hype at, at, at that time because he was the handsome leader. He was, I mean, he had no rhetorical skills, for instance, and that's why he cultivated also silence. Yeah. And this was very important. In a country and, where people talk too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exa exactly. And I mean, they had even his movement, the legendary movement, then had it, its own cult of silence. So don't talk too much. Yeah, The average Romanian talks talks too much, politicians talk too much, but we are silent and we do and we work. And the second uh, thing certainly was, and uh, there's a huge debate also in research, but I think that um, he was really a believer and he, he felt deeply rooted in orthodox um, traditions. And that's why he got very early the full support 
not the official one, but a very um, efficient one of the Romanian Orthodox Church, mainly of monasteries in Eastern Romania. And then he evolved in the kind of um, phenomenon into which many political, um, let's say, tendencies, many um, different social groups projected their, their vision, their hopes for a new Romania. And that's why um, his movement, the legendary movement, um, developed into a catch-all party. So in the late 30s, there you could find in this party uh, Romanian aristocrats, but also um, the legionaries were the leading force um, of the Roma new, newly evolved, recently evolved Romanian working class. But Codreanu himself as, as a leader was completely, he was rather weak leader at the, at the end because he was completely overwhelmed by what he had created. He was, um, I mean, he was trained at the military school uh, in, in the old regard in Southern Romania. And his teachers, and they, I mean, they evaluated him very well. They, they thought he's a, good, he's a very good lieutenant, but a very bad general. So he had a kind of face-to-face -face leadership. He wanted to know people. He, built his, let's say, his system on trust. But I mean, when you have more than uh, 250,000 uh, followers, you cannot know your people. And that's why um, he simply lost control. And uh, the, he, he was also um, very much under the influence, directly or indirectly, of important members of the, of the Romanian political establishment. So he was, as an opposition leader, also part of the establishment, but when he did not accept any longer this deal and he wanted full power, then um, he was also then destroyed by the system and he, he was then uh, assassinated by, by the king. But his legacy is very interesting because he was certainly the most charismatic um, politician uh, of interwar Romania, although he was so un-Romanian for instance, he had no humor at all. And, and this is really very weird in a country where people like to laugh and like to make jokes. Not at all. He was not at all interested in culture as a member of the Romanian elite. Never attended the theater play. He um, was not interested in sports or leisure and so on. He was so um, austere and severe and, um, and, and, and the character that was so, let's say, um, different from the average um, politician and this created probably also trust that the people believe and he was poor and in a country where many politicians at one moment or the other um, were um, tempted by um, the possibilities to enrich themselves this was also an exception but this man was a radical I mean he, he was a fascist he was an anti-democrat um, but Julio Maniu, whom I mentioned before, who was really the Gallian figure of um, pro-Western Democrats, um, joined forces with uh, Cotereano in 1937 because both were fighting against uh, a king who wanted to try to destroy the constitutional system. And this coalition between a pro-Axis fascist politician who had um, an orthodoxist mission. I mean, he was, um, for, for him, orthodoxy and, and the political life were deeply combined. And someone who was really a pro-Western might be very weird, but in the Romanian context, both joined forces against an establishment that was actually acting against the constitution. I know that's extremely complicated for someone who is not so familiar with Romania, but I simply, one has to mention it because you asked me right at the, at the beginning of our conversation, how to explain it. And here we have a wonderful example how difficult things are, but we have to address it in, in, in that way in, in order to, to understand mechanisms of this society. And obviously through Codreanu and others, you arrived at the destruction of Romanian uh, democracy in 1938 uh, and uh, ensuing uh, dictatorship um, in which was very clear that extremist polarization led to this, um, to this outcome. Um, um, having dealt so, so, much, uh, so much on this topic, how do you see, what is the, the lessons, the historical lessons of this, uh, of this outcome for today, for the time 
uh, we are uh, living when, uh, unfortunately, we see that the extremism, radicalism um, have, um, have, have become, again, a, a problem for uh, our democracies. Not, of course, I'm not talking about, uh, maybe not about Romania primarily, but I'm talking about Europe in general and the world in general. Well, some ideas, um, the liberal democracy, ideas um, have become um, have become quite uh, influential yeah i think it's once once again the the point i tried to raise before is trust it's mainly trust in in institutions uh, and i think that um, all those who are working in in the state institutions now have a special responsibility i mean that's true for many countries of the western world and the United States, but also many European countries, and I think, for instance, on demonstrations in the Netherlands because of COVID, uh, it's really it's a crisis. It's a crisis of trust. Um, people do not believe that, uh, that that what they are told by governments is is completely true. Um, they sometimes have dif difficulties difficulties to um, believe that the same is also true for science. And also, let's say you mentioned I'm also a member of the presiding committees of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And for, for us, we are, of course, concerned by the way of how people perceive science and mainly what scientists say now in times of COVID. And um, there, for instance, science is a very good example because you have some people who um, perceive science as a kind of religion and you have really to believe in science and there's only one truth in science. And then scientists who have um, to tell that, that there is no truth in science and that it's an ongoing debate. And COVID is a very good um, example that, I mean, that our our knowledge also on the um, on what COVID is and we how can and, and on how we can react to this crisis evolves also um, with different kind of studies and analysis we are doing, but this is of course extremely complex and I think that's what leads us to a, to a next point that many people and we have to admit it that it's really human that faced with uh, such a number of highly interrelated and complex problems, one capitulates, or um, one has the tendencies um, to, uh, let's say, to have recourse to very simple and simplifying uh, answers. But I, what, what I would say, and also in the case, and perhaps coming to the case of Romania, I think um, why democracy failed uh, in the 30s was mainly also due uh, to the attitude and the position of pillars of the state. And what are pillars of the state? Of course, state institutions, it's the army and the security system, um, but there are also religious institutions as for instance, the church, the science institutions, scientific institutions. In the Romanian case, it would be the Academy of Sciences. And all these institutions uh, in the critical moment, they did not defend um, democracy, but they all um, were ready uh, to cooperate with political actors who were clearly heading towards uh, uh, authoritarian system. Uh, and these, these actors from the church, um, the science system and so on, they, they mainly um, their behavior can be explained also by, let's say rather personal um, advantages they get in terms of career and even sometimes even in terms of money. And then coming back to your um, general question, I think that we have to invest uh, much into, uh, let's say, rebuilding trust into, into uh, institutions. This is really essential. And it depends uh, not only on the top of, let's say, the political, uh, uh, of, of the top, top political level, but it depends really on everyone. I mean, all those school teachers, policemen, university professors as I am, and so on. And, it, and it's our, our example and it's our personal investment in that. Because without strong institutions, a democracy cannot survive. And we really see that. And a democracy is a kind of, um, it's, it's a kind of referendum, uh, everyday referendum. So just to, 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 quote, in a, uh, to, to quote Ernest uh, Renan, and uh, it depends on us. Um, indeed, we must uh, we must rebuild uh, trust, and it's our duty to uh, to make democracy work every day. Um, of course, we are going through a very very difficult time. It's a tragic time, I would say. Uh, 
this um, uh, this um, never-ending pandemic, unfortunately, with new waves, with new um, with new uh, new tragedies creating all over the world. Uh, sometimes, if you look back in history, you see that you know a big pandemic or you know the uh, the consequences of the, the social consequences of a, the a big pandemic um, have been uh, able to bring down country systems, um, create uh, crises that were so uh, so unbearable that uh, that huge uh, transformations um, followed. Do you see any risk in that happening in our world today? I'm thinking of Europe mainly. How do you think the European Union would emerge? Um, after the after the the pandemic, which is nowhere the end uh, end of which is nowhere in sight, but still, yeah, it's certainly true that um, uh, the performance of the European Union uh, could be better. I mean, if you remember last year, um, the different kind of let's say of levels of uh, competitions between national national states, um, the, the lack of coordination. Um, a relapse into, let's say, nationalist uh, rhetorics. I mean, it's not only due to COVID. I mean, we, we had it, the nationalization, let's say, of, um, of concrete political problems, uh, unfortunately, has, has been a phenomenon even, even before. It was now, it's now more accentuated than it was before. Of course, I mean, um, it's, it's evident that the uh, European Union, who has cultivated over many years mainly soft power, is now a rather weak um, actor on the scene, a very weak um, player on the moment. I mean, when this, uh, just have a look on the, the competition over uh, vaccination and, and so on, the European Commission certainly is not um, a power that might intimidate, uh, let's say, producers uh, to deliver um, more quickly uh, to European countries um, what they what these countries actually deserve. So I think what what we should um, learn is uh, to define more clearly common goals. And you also see it in in the common foreign policy, which um, until now does simply not exist. I mean, you have, for instance, in strategically important areas as Libya, which is a kind of a key to Europe for mass immigration, a competition between France and Italy as the two main power on the Mediterranean. Uh, you have, um, let's say, in, secure, in terms of security policy, um, the, the, the interests of countries, for instance, as Romania or Poland or the Baltic states are very different from those, let's say, in, in Southern Europe and, and so on. And um, we have uh, political mechanisms of um, decision taking in Europe that are very slow and simply inefficient. So one has to rethink that. And um, even if you are skeptical, what you can learn from, from history is that uh, Europe uh, actually has many times survived. Yeah? Um, it has survived, when one has to admit, mainly with money. Yeah, and we, we resolved the last crisis with a lot of money. And uh, I think that this policy of the European Central Bank has also reached its limits. So one has now um, really to tackle the political and institutional problems. That's certainly first. But what we also need and what we, what we also can um, observe what happened in Europe is we need a completely new kind of education. It cannot be that um, Every time when we have a political crisis that politi politicians on the, on the base of the national state reactivate nationalist discourses. It cannot be that on the one hand, we have a Europe where many people circulate and Romanians are the best examples. There are millions of, uh, of Romanians living in other European countries. I'm also a Swiss living in Austria. Um, so many people, so we have at least already two generations of people who share a common European experience, but um, the children are still educated um, according to very old fashioned nationalist um, ideas of, of history. And we have to admit that, and this is also true for Austria, the average Austrian does not know uh, his neighbors. He does not speak their languages. He's not at all interested in that. And it's a kind of introspection in the national, uh, international uh, school curricula. And we have to change that. We have, um, let's say, we, we have to um, create a new kind um, 
of educational system where what we learn in school does actually correspond also to the realities in Europe and where um, we learn that if crisis emerges, we do not blame our neighbor. And that certainly, I mean, it's sad to say that after so many decades of European history, but um, and also common, uh, this common European uh, way. But I think that um, if we, I mean, the crisis is there, it's a very difficult one. And we see that um, once again, having a look to very stable and rich uh, countries as the Netherlands, and even where in these countries you have um, social unrest, you have to take it uh, very, very seriously. And no one can predict um, the actual economic consequences of um, what is happening. But what we can certainly analyze and see are several political fields. And I tried just to highlight two of them where actions can be taken where we can do something. And um, I would say that also on a very modest level, what we are doing, I mean, uh, you as a Romanian intellectual based in New York and I as a Swiss uh, historian based in Austria, we exchange our ideas and we have a conversation on, on politics and uh, Romania and uh, Romanian culture and culture and, and political questions in Romania and beyond. Is, is a modest contribution to that. And it's exactly also what uh, then all people who are now watching um, our conversations are doing. It's this kind of interest. Enlarge your horizon, and then you will not fall into the traps um, that are omnipresent, unfortunately, at the moment in the Western world. And especially, and I think that's perhaps also interesting, important for um, the American spectators. Um, we have to revive the old idea of a common democratic West. I mean, there has been done uh, enormous damage in Europe. It's unfortunately Brexit. And um, this was also a question of, um, of trust and perceptions and so on. We have to take that seriously and we have to understand ourselves better. It was certainly a mistake that we have completely underestimated the importance of culture. It's not only the economy. It's also of what, how we are and um, how we perceive our neighbors and uh, what actually the world and the values is we, we want to live in. And that's something we have to, we have to redefine, but, but still um, here I'm rather confident. It's, um, it's a fascinating discussion. Of course, uh, obviously we haven't taken the legion's oath of silence and our conversation definitely can go on <laughs> forever. With the, there are so many things we can uh, discuss with them. I'm afraid we have to, uh, we have to, um, uh, to stop here. Um, I'd like to thank you um, once more, Professor, for um, having accepted our invitation and for this wonderful uh, wonderful ideas ideas that are not only pertinent but very very timely even um, the more so today when um, uh, as i said at the beginning we are celebrating a very important date in our uh, in the memory of uh, humankind the um, international um, international holocaust um, remembrance um, a day and there have been so many uh, so many uh, ideas and observations about it. I think it's a day of uh, remembrance. It's a day of reflection. And we hope this um, conversation may, um, may have contributed and may contribute to uh, uh, enhancing the reflection and the awareness uh, about the perils of extremism and about the, the tragic consequences of the uh, uh, of the destruction of um, uh, democracy. I'd like to invite all, all our viewers to, because uh, this is this uh, special day, to watch a, um, a very interesting uh, production of uh, Romanian national broadcaster, Tevere, uh, that we had the privilege to, um, uh, to uh, broadcast in uh, international premiere about Transnistria, about um, uh, our unfortunate contribution in the, in the Shoah. It's, our, um, it's our, on our um, social media platform, so uh, it's a really worth um, taking a look. Professor, once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank all our uh, viewers. 
um, our pro online program is in full swing, so uh, you can find everything from history to music and uh, visual arts uh, every week here on at the Romanian Cultural Institute, the online version.